Hey, thanks for joining me. I'm really excited to share with you some of the things that God's been teaching me uh, in Colossians. Um, tonight, I'm going to be sharing with you some things from Colossians chapter 1 in verses 15 through 23. Uh, so go ahead and read with me. Um, I'm reading from the ESV. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, talking about Jesus, the firstborn of all creation. Now, I want to pause there for just a second because sometimes that seems a little bit weird saying he's the firstborn of all creation. Um, but what it means is not that he was the first birthed, but that he is of the first and foremost authority and supremacy of all creation. Okay, let's get back to it. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So really, the key thing here, Paul's saying is, it's all about Jesus. And when I was preparing this text and reading this text, it really made me think of a song uh, by Chris Tomlin called, Is He Worthy? This passage also really makes me think of John chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1, and also the book of Revelation. Um, now, I want to read to you the lyrics from the song, Is He Worthy? Um, because when I read this passage about the preeminence of Christ, it really just drives me to my knees in humility and reverence and awe of who Jesus is. So the song starts out and it says, Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The lion of Judah who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And does Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The lion of Judah who conquered the grave, he is David's root and the lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priests to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He is. I would just encourage you guys, I've been listening to that song on repeat because it's just so humbling to think about and to remember who Jesus is. And that's what Paul's talking about here in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. He's talking about how Jesus is everything. Now, as I continue to dig a little bit deeper in the text, I was looking at and realizing that there's also kind of a theme. We have a tendency to compromise Jesus. So what do I mean when I say compromise Jesus? Because I just talked about how powerful he is and that he is worthy and that he is more and he is first and he is most. I don't mean that we could compromise him, but I mean that we allow him to be compromised in our life and in our minds because we choose to follow a counterfeit Christ. Not Christ as who he is, who God says he is, but who we think that he is or who we think that he should be. Um, a lesser variation of Jesus. 
Now this reminds me of an article I read years ago, um, and it's actually gonna be posted in the link below, um, so you guys can check it out yourself, but it's called 10 Counterfeit Christ Figures We Need to Stop Following. And it's unpacking different Jesuses that we're tempted to follow. Now, some of them are outright wrong. Um, some of them are pretty good and seem to make a lot of sense, but they're not complete. They're not whole. They're kind of lacking. And they got fun names like Braveheart Jesus or Guru Jesus or Dr. Phil Jesus or Patriotic Jesus. But the thing is, these are Jesuses that are modeled in our image. And we're called to model ourselves after his image. We are called not to compromise Jesus, but to follow Jesus as he is. And so the key message that I want you guys to understand about the preeminence of Christ in this passage is not to compromise Jesus. See, something with culture. Um, our culture doesn't really have a problem with Jesus as a good man. What they have a problem with as a whole, what the world has had a problem with as a whole since the beginning is the God-man. Not the good man, but the God man is the thing that they have an issue with and that there's a struggle with. See, it's easy to follow a Jesus that teaches good and nice things, even if it's just because we like what he represents and the idea um, of his character and taking care of others and loving others. But it's when we're called the sacrificial and uncomfortable things and hard things and selfless things, when we're called to submit to God, even when we don't fully understand why he's asking us to do things, that it's a lot harder to follow him because he's not just a good man, but he is a God man. Now, there's another thing that I wanna encourage you guys from this passage um, is that we need to be really careful not to let our life drive our theology, but we need to let our theology drive our life. Now, I'm not trying to glamorize like all of these deep thinking thoughts. Those are great and those are awesome, but really the word of God needs to be the thing that drives our theology and our understanding of who God is and in light of that, what it means for how we're supposed to live. So what does it look like to let our theology drive our life versus letting our life drive our theology? Well, when I start hunting for passages and assuming that they mean what I think that they mean so it can confirm the decisions that I'm making in my life, chances are I'm letting my life drive my theology. But if I'm humbly going to the word of God and letting that be the thing that informs and guides my decisions, then I know that I'm letting my theology drive my life. So on a personal and practical level, what does that look like for me? And one of the big areas is actually in the area of politics. I'm not going to get specific right now about all of those things, but I will say that sometimes I'm tempted to let fear or my political preferences drive my ballot instead of looking to the word of God and letting that be the thing that drives the decisions that I make um, when it comes to voting and elections and politics. Um, now, I know that that may manifest a little differently for some people, but one of the things that I was really convicted by in letting my theology drive my life is that the Word of God dictates every area of decisions that I make, not financial impact or not the fears that I have about how things may or may not look, but the things that Jesus says matters most. Now, another thing that's kind of interesting here um, in talking kind of about life driving our theology versus theology driving our life um, the, the Christians of the time in Colossae were tempted um, to focus on some of the wrong things. And one of the things that they were kind of obsessive over in this time was actually angelology. Um, they were obsessing over a study of angels and putting too much emphasis on it. So it's kind of why Paul is actually specifically talking about how Jesus is above dominions and rulers and authorities. Because he's saying regardless of what is or isn't when it comes to the heavenly realm, Jesus is most and he is foremost. And so if you're focusing too much on something else, then you're losing shift and focus on what you should be paying attention to. And that is that Christ is first and most in all things, that he is preeminent. Don't compromise Jesus. Don't lose sight of Jesus just because you find something else that suits your fancy. If you want to study those other things, that's great, but make sure that Christ stays center in all things. So when it comes to our theology in our life, this also reminds me a lot of Matthew chapter 7 and Luke chapter 6, when it's talking about the wise man and the foolish man, and how the wise man built his house on a rock, but the foolish man built his house on sand. See, when I build my theology on my life, my preferences, um, or even my personal convictions that are outside of the word of God and scripture. It's like building a house on something unstable and shifting because my preferences change constantly. The music I listen to now is drastically different than it was 10 and 15 years ago. Even the foods that I prefer or can't stand have changed somewhat in a little bit. Um, so who it is that I am is changing, but God is unchanging. His word is unchanging. His son is unchanging. And so I need to build my theology and my life on his word, 
And I need to let that be the rock and the firm foundation. Another way of kind of thinking about it is we have a tendency to decorate the house before we first built the foundation. And if we do that, we have to start all over again because everything's gonna come crashing down around us. Um, another thought that came to mind while studying this passage, um, we, we like wisdom, we like knowledge, um, but without Jesus, life, wisdom, and knowledge are incomplete and temporary because he is eternal. And so if we want our knowledge, our wisdom, and our life to have eternal value and worth, then it needs to be found in Christ because he is preeminent, he is first, and he is foremost. I love the way that one commentator described what Paul says in verses, uh, let's see, 19 through 23. And they describe it as Jesus is the distribution point of grace. When they're talking about that it's in him and it's through him, in verse 19, for in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and that through him reconciliation happens, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. See, grace is found in him. He is the source. He is the distribution point. Now, as we talk a little bit about not compromising Jesus, we talk about letting our theology drive our life instead of our life driving our theology and understanding who Jesus truly is, not as we want him to be, but who he actually is. Um, I'm kind of reminded of this analogy that um, God kind of shared with me over the past few months, and it's this idea of a merry-go-round. Now, I loved riding a merry-go-round as a kid. Um, I was also often one that was like, spinning it as fast as possible, you know, like the kids will go faster, faster, and you go as fast as you possibly can. And when you stay on the outer edges of the merry-go-round looking out, you get a little bit nauseous watching the world go by really quickly, and you start to lose your footing, and you have to hold on really tight because you're about to fall over. But if you were like me, and you would stand in the merry-go-round, and you would turn around, and you would look at the center, that no matter how fast the merry-go-round went, no matter how many people were around the outside, you were standing secure and solid because you were oriented toward the middle and toward the center. And I think that's a lot like life. Life is crazy, it's unstable, there's a lot of shifting circumstances on the outside and sometimes it goes at a dizzying pace. But when we orient ourselves towards Christ and when we're looking towards him as our rock, our foundation, our center, our everything, then we can stand firm and we can stand solid regardless of the external circumstances. See, the thing is, it's Jesus. It's all Jesus. It needs to be Jesus. So I would just encourage you to remember that it's all about him and it's for him. Don't compromise Jesus.